This is the conclusion to my DC universe. If you're a returning viewer, you may already know what I'm on about, but for those who are new, welcome. Let me quickly bring you up to speed. So, some time ago, I made a video saying how I would make a good Superman movie. Three good Superman movies, actually. Initially, it was going to be just that. I just felt compelled to show you guys that I am ready for an earnest and optimistic Superman again. However, I felt compelled about another. I followed up that video outlining how to make a good Green Lantern saga, then a Flash movie, before storyboarding an hour-long video showing how I would make a Justice League movie. I then continued upon that video, showing how I would make a Phase 2 in that universe, continuing the stories of these characters, leading to an eventual Justice League 2. And this is where we are now, Phase 3, the conclusion. What all these movies have led to, the New Gods, the Legion, the Justice League, heroes old and new, it all ends here. So strap in, this video is going to be a doozy. I'm a big believer in clarity. I know this video will throw a lot of ideas at you, so I want to try and make this as ergonomic as possible. Keep things simple, you know, because I'm a nice guy. So let's outline what we'll be doing today. First off, I'm going to get the cast out of the way, then I'll take you through the existing timeline of these movies, then I'll take you through Phase 3 before tying the saga up with Justice League 3. So with that being said, let's not waste any time, let's talk casting. As I've said, I don't think there's any merit in wasting your time. If you've seen the previous videos, you know who's who. Here's your Batman cast, take it in. Here's your Superman cast, yep, yep, okay. And your Flash cast, got it, cool. And your Green Lantern cast. All these names you've seen before in previous videos, there's nothing new here. So let's turn towards phase two, the characters I've yet to put a name to. For the sake of time, I'm just going to spitball these. All right, let's do it. Dick Grayson is Finn Whitrock, Jason Todd is Cameron Cuff, Lady Shiva is Olivia Munn, Ra's al Ghul is Rufus Sewell, and Talia al Ghul is Naomi Scott, Mr. Freeze is Mark Strong, Killer Croc is... Okay, look, I'm not going to try and butcher that name, you guys can read, he's done some great work and would make a killer... Eh? Eh? Killer Croc. Okay, Hawkman is Jamie Dornan, Red Tornado is Jeff Bennett, our young Doctor Fate in the first Wonder Woman is Austin Butler, and our older Doctor Fate is Charles Dance. Charlie Hunnam is Green Arrow, and Catherine Winnick is Black Canary. Aquaman is Travis Fimmel, Black Manta is Michael James Shaw, Cheetah is Charlize Theron, Count Vertigo is Alexander Skarsgård, and Kyle Lumbly is Malifa Ark. Into the New Gods, we have Sam Hewen as Horion, Milo Ventimiglia as Mr. Miracle, Gina Carano as Big Barda, Jeff Bridges as High Father, and Kathy Bates as Granny Goodness, with Peter Guinness as Desaad and Andre Bra as Darkseid. As for Brainiac 5, seen in the post credit scene in Superman 2, he will be played by Nick Robinson. Now, for Phase 3, characters we'll first see here in this video. Let's keep the momentum going with the Legion. We have Tyler Posey as Cosmic Boy, Jack Rayner as Lightning Lad, Dove Cameron as Saturn Girl, Rico Rodriguez as Bouncing Boy, and Asia Butterfield as Chameleon Boy. As for additional leaguers, we'll see we got Glenn Powell as Booster Gold. Isn't that just perfect casting, by the way? He was made for that role. We have Turner Paris as Vixen, Carl Urban as Captain Adam, Manny Jacinto as The Adam, and Dan Stevens as Adam Strange. We also have Garrett Hedlund as Miramar, Callan Mulvey as Heatwave and Diego Luna as Weather Wizard with TJ Apa as Wally West as well as Jane Levy as Batgirl and Lucas Jade Zuman as Tim Drake with Olivia T. Dudley as Power Girl and Traji P. Henson as Amanda Waller. So I think that's everyone. If there's anyone I missed comment below because I probably have an actor in mind. With that being said let's move on to the timeline. But before we do I just want to talk about something I've been up to. As you guys know, The Flash is my favorite hero. I absolutely love him. That's inspired me to run a marathon. 42 kilometers, that's 26 miles. Now the sponsor of this video is helping me do that, Raycon. Raycon's snug fitting earbuds have helped me immensely in my training. I can run freely without the worry of cords or bulky headphones. These earbuds have completely helped me with my training. I can listen to my favorite beats whilst getting in some steps. I honestly just really rate them. They hit the perfect price point for me, an affordable earbud that doesn't destroy the bank. With over 50,000 five-star reviews, it's safe to say the convenience of these is just unmatched. With the earbud tap functions and custom gel tips perfect for a comfortable fit, they make it perfect for running or doing stuff like this. Look at that, and they're still in. 
If you're ready to buy something small but with a big impact, click the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com slash superframe to get 15% off of your Raycon purchase. Raycon has changed the game for me and by buying Raycon, you'll be supporting the channel. Now with that being said, let's jump back into the video. Jumping straight into phase one, we begin with the Batman. I've seen it, you've seen it, let's keep going. We then jump into Superman, Man of Tomorrow, giving audiences the definitive Superman story, an earnest hero doing the right thing. After that, we open up the cosmos with Green Lantern, how facing the Guardian's past sins in that of the Manhunters. We then return to Gotham with the second Batman movie, Heart of Night. Flash will then liven things up with his first outing before jumping back to World War II with Diana and the Justice Society in Wonder Woman. The HBO Max Green Lantern Corps show will show us the underbelly of the galaxy we never saw in the first Green Lantern movie. Speaking of GL, its sequel, Sinestro Corps, will give us a Revenge of the Sith scale conflict between Hell and Sinestro. After that, we're jumping back to Superman, introducing Supergirl and showing the overpowering might of Brainiac. Little side note, Supergirl is approached by the Legion in the end credit scene, disappearing with them into the future. From here, we jump into Justice League. We see the team form, new players like Hawkgirl and the Martian Manhunter join the team, and the Thanagarian threat thwarted. Say that three times fast. Green Lantern, Rage of the Red Lanterns, will show us what Hal was up to during the events of Justice League, the movie ending with Oa destroyed and the Guardians rebuilding without their hubris that got them in that situation in the first place. Superman, Last Son, will conclude Superman's trilogy. Very all-star Superman, it will illustrate Luthor to be shown as an outright villain to the public. Superman tells Lois his identity, it's all great. After that, we follow up with Nightwing. Excluded from the events of Justice League and pushed aside more and more, Dick Grayson just decides to leave Batman for Bloodhaven. Teaming up with Kravitz's Catwoman, they take on a criminal plot run by Lady Shiva. Keep that in mind. Nightwing is subsequently replaced by the new Robin, Jason Todd, and we see that not go so well in the third Batman movie, The Man Who Laughs. Adapting the death in the family and the Red Hood storylines, we leave Batman in a broken place, haunted by his failures, by failing Jason. Leaving Earth, we're beginning to set up our Darkseid conflict. The New Gods series will lay out the groundwork for lore regarding the Source, New Genesis, and Apocalypse, the Old and New Gods, Mother Boxes, and all that. Told through the eyes of Mr. Miracle and Big Barter, it'll be a Shakespearean epic on a scale of something like Dune. After that, we jump back to The Flash. Being an emotionally balanced person and overcoming his traumas, Barry now fills the role of a teacher with his nephew, Wally West. And I say nephew because this movie is where Iris and Barry will get married proving he can slow down and commit to a life with Iris, the two decide to pull the trigger on tying the knot, regardless of any talking gorillas that want to get in the way. Now, all of this big sci-fi is great and all, Superman and the Flash and the New Gods, but what about the little guy? That's where Green Arrow comes in. With the assistance of Black Canary, the two thought Count Vertigo's grab for control over an Eastern European country of Relasia. The series ending with Batman asking them to come on board with the League, that they've done good work here and could be useful. As for Wonder Woman, for her sequel, we're going to tell an isolating story that puts her on her own as she goes down the inferno trying to rescue a soul. Her physicality is challenged with an increasingly difficult threats, but that's not it. Her values, her ideas are challenged too. Her belief in humanity is scorned as Minerva falls to the cheetah power, revels in it. After that, we're concluding Phase 2 with Justice League 2. Adapting the Tower of Babel, or Doom, whatever you want to call it, we see the League taken out by Luthor and the Legion of Doom only for a new player, Aquaman, to come in and assist the League one at a time. And that's where we're at. The day is saved, but the League feels betrayed by Batman in regards to him having contingency plans made for them. Wonder Woman specifically is disheartened by this betrayal as she has constantly put her faith in humanity, only to have it spat back in her face seeing the violence of men in World War II, the corruptible nature of us with the cheetah, and our fear manifesting in precautions against friends with Batman. Before the League votes Batman out, he leaves on his own accord. If Justice League 2 were to have its own end credit scene, it would be Bruce establishing Batman Inc. Now, I want to highlight something here. Whilst this is all an interconnected universe, each trilogy, if you will, has tackled something very specific, in a way making them unique. Now this isn't uncommon, Marvel has done this as well. The Captain America movies take on a spy espionage vibe. The Spider-Man movies resemble John Hughes' teen movies, and the Guardians movies have a unique pulp to them. What I'm getting at is that they all have their own identity. So, looking at the DC movies I've just taken you through, what is the message? What is the identity? What am I trying to say with either the trilogy? Well, if we look at Green Lantern, every bad guy, the Manhunters, Sinestro, Atrocitus, has either come from the sins, arrogance, or hubris of the Guardians. By the third movie, having them learn humility. Which two do? Said and Ganthet, who found the Blue Lantern Corps. Hell's journey, essentially, is witnessing this unfold. 
saving the Guardians from their sins, saving the galaxy from monsters the Guardians had a hand in creating. The consistent theme here is the monsters we create, monsters created from a lack of humanity, a literal lacking of it, a spiritual lacking of it, or an ethical lacking of it. It's the Guardians' lack of humanity that caused their problems. For Wonder Woman, in both her first and second installment, we push the idea of her wrestling with her faith in humanity. In the first, we saw Hawkman give up on humanity whilst Diana believed it was worth saving. In the sequel, she now questions that decision as Minerva sells her soul, so to speak, for power. So, this idea will run through all three movies, and it's an idea we'll come back to in her third. As for Flash, his story has been one of growth, moving past his trauma, past his desire to be everywhere and do everything, he's learned to slow down, to have a life. In the second installment, we get to see him put that into practice, have him teach what he's learned. So, the only thing I guess we can do in the third installment is to take that away from him. For Batman, his journey has been one of renewal. The renewal project being a central plot point in the first Batman movie, but that's not what I'm talking about. Renewal means to start again. Bruce in the first movie gave up being vengeance, literally was reborn, baptized into a hero. He started again. In the sequel, we need to show that he can show another to start again. When a boy loses his family in a very similar way to Batman, it is Bruce that decides to let this boy start again. Give him a frame, a purpose, and a goal. Bruce having saved Dick and letting him renew believes he can do the same to Freeze, but Freeze just believes he's too far gone, that he needs to exact his vengeance on the ones that made him a monster and led to Nora being in a suspended state. Now, for the third Batman movie, you could say Jason literally starts again, a perversion of this renewal idea, a theme inverted, coming back to Gotham with a hit list with the Joker at the very top. We see him challenge Batman's moral code, that his form of justice isn't working, ultimately leading Batman down a path of increasing introspection and a face-off for the ages. In regards to Superman, his arc is what we call a flat character arc, a flat character arc is where the hero does not change, they stay the same. Instead, the journey is about learning to uphold their inner truth in a world that doesn't accept it, allowing them to overcome the external conflict along the way. Try think Captain America, a man that doesn't bow down no matter what. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right, even if the whole world is telling you to move, it is your duty to plant yourself like a tree Look them in the eye and say, no, you move. I want Superman to be a beacon of hope, that we can be optimistic in a cynical world, that being human is important. And hopefully, if done right, that ever earnest nature will slowly show that Metropolis and the world that they were wrong. In the first movie, we see a cynical Metropolis that comes around once they see Superman fighting for them. In the sequel, we show that Clark's humanity is a strength and not a weakness Brainiac believes it to be. And in the third, we reaffirm that humanity as Clark is able to talk down Bizarro and reveal Luthor to be the cynical narcissist that he is, killing with kindness, so to speak, showing the strength of being human. So, what I think we've been able to do here is to pull out and view these movies on a macro level. What are these trilogies trying to say? And if we do one better and pull out even further, what are all these movies trying to say? Well, if we distill these stories down into its simplest form, what we find is a common thread. These are all tales of humanity. We see humanity, the people of Metropolis, save Superman in his first film. In the follow-up, we see Brainiac question Superman's strength of character as he was raised human. For Wonder Woman, the fallibility of man, the degradation and the loss of humanity she and the Justice Society are thrown into makes the heroes question their belief in people's inherent goodness. For Green Lantern, it's a lack of humanity on the Guardian's behalf that caused the rise of the Manhunters, Sinestro and Atrocitus. For The Flash, it was learning to appreciate being human to slow down that allowed him to have a life. It was the human moment shared between John and Shiara that swayed her to fight for Earth. What we have is a tale of humanity. This, this is my ultimate point regarding the Justice League. The Justice League has always been a tale of humanity. It's not about men becoming gods, that's Marvel. It's about gods becoming men. It's about finding the humanity, the human moments in these large scale conflicts. It's about connecting with the people that they save and being an inspiration. Not because of their feats, but because they showed us we can be better. It's in phase one that we established this notion, and in phase two we were able to make our characters question their beliefs. Red Hood attacks Batman's moral code and its effectiveness on crime. Wonder Woman's belief in humanity is shaken with Minerva falling to the power of the cheetah. What I'm trying to do here, and what you'll soon see, is I want to leave our heroes in the worst place possible before Darkseid arrives. 
like breaking up the Avengers in Civil War before Thanos comes to play in Infinity War. I want to break the League. I want to have them spread thin, at breaking point before hell rains down on them. So with that being said, let's jump into my plans for Phase 3. Now, for Phase 3, I think it's important that we're going to be showing the fallout of prior movies, how the consequences of Phase 2 bleeds into Phase 3, following up with heroes and villains alike. Speaking of following up, Phase 3 will begin with the Legion of Superheroes. Picking up directly after the events of that end credit scene will tell a Supergirl-centric tale in the future. Whilst the A plot might be the Legion facing, say, I don't know, the Fatal Five, what we do is introduce a B plot, a hidden truth that is kept from Kara throughout the series, one she slowly learns, a truth that Superman dies facing Darkseid, that Supergirl's presence during the battle caused his death, Superman jumping in to selflessly save his cousin, dying in the process. Suddenly, it makes sense why the Legion pulled Supergirl into the future, taking her out of the fight and allowing Superman to live. Naturally, a conflicted Supergirl doesn't trust the Legion as they've kept this truth from her, so the series ends as she flees to the past to warn her cousin, to save him. So, essentially what we've done here is we've introduced a ticking bomb into our saga. For those that don't know, the idea of the bomb in film conventions works like this. Two characters are sitting at a table and a bomb explodes. Sure, there may be a shock factor, but what if you first showed the bomb under the table before the characters sat down? Suddenly, their entire conversation would be tense because you know something is about to go boom. Now, that's what we're doing here. Now, it's fine for a character to sacrifice themselves for something or for someone, but that can be made even better by a sense of dread that pervades the lead up to that moment, like a car crash you just can't look away from. Going into Justice League 3, we will feel a race against time quality as Supergirl emerges to warn her cousin of his fate. However, we're moving too far ahead, too fast, for lack of a better words. Fitting then that we're following up the Legion of Superheroes with the third Flash film. What I want to do in this movie is to tell a Flash story that is just a complete celebration of the Flash. The rogues will be the main villains here. Defeated here and there, it's when Mirror Master comes on the scene, do the rogues start to unify in a way they really never have before. Now, when I say I want this movie to be a celebration of the Flash, I mean it. I'd love a moment in the final fight where each Flash gets to take on one or two of the rogues. Jay dons the tin hat once more to fight Weather Wizard, Wally takes on Heatwave, and Barry takes on the combined might of Captain Cold and Mirror Master. I think there's a lot of fun to be had here. Inventive fight scenes with Mirror Master's use of the mirror dimension. Kinda like the character of the spot from the 90s Spider-Man series. Those portals are too dangerous. You've got to stop using them. Nonsense. Oh boy. Not this again. Now, whilst the rogue's goals are inherently trivial, holding a city ransom with a bomb for some money or whatnot, the goal really isn't important here. What is important is how we end this movie. I want the Flash to talk Mirror Master down, show that Barry's strength isn't his speed, it's always been his temperament, being a balanced individual, an empathetic and caring man that is kind yet dutiful, understanding but willing to tell people what they need to hear. Sort of like what we saw with Superman in Justice League 1. So the Flash talks Mirror Master down, however the remote to the bomb isn't working, it isn't stopping the detonation, it's going to blow. An energy field that'll take out all of Central City, and so Barry runs to counter the energy surges. Jay, Wally, the rogues, all they can do is watch on as the energy has cocooned. Barry is stuck in an energy bomb he is unwinding with his speed. He's successful, but at the cost of running so fast that he joins the speed force. He dies. So, the Flash's death is something a lot of comic readers know. It's a whole thing. We all know Wally takes up the mantle and becomes just as great, if not greater, of a Flash than Barry. And this, this movie will be our way of leaning into that. We get to tell a movie that celebrates Barry as a hero, shows why he works so well and the legacy he will leave. Then we have the balls to pass that baton. Perhaps Wally breaks the news to Iris, in tears the two share a moment, but it's Iris that says that the world needs the Flash, a hero that represents courage, one that embodies a balanced temperament. So moving forward, Wally will carry on Barry's legacy. Of course, with his wisecracking Wally spin on things. Hopefully you can see what we're doing here. We're leaving our Justice League in a weakened state before Pebblehead over here arrives on Earth. We're trying to make the League as vulnerable as possible, so as an audience member, we shit ourselves along with the heroes because we know how ill-prepared they are. The Flash is dead. What we have replacing him is a kid Flash. A boy that has to become a man and prove himself. That Wally belongs in those yellow boots. That he deserves to call himself the fastest man alive. Now, as I explained in my Green Lantern video, Green Lantern 4 will be an inversion of 3. 
whilst Rage of the Red Lanterns will end big, Agent Orange will start big and get increasingly introspective. Throughout these movies, we've often explored the Guardian's sins and how it created the villains in front of us, but here, I want to use the two new lanterns, Greed and Compassion, to examine the soul of Hal Jordan, leaving the movie a changed man, more so than he ever has before. Throughout Hal's saga so far, he's been busy saving people from their sins, their mistakes. Here, I want to continue the theme of inversion, by now having Hal save himself. In order to overcome greed, compassion is the answer. Now, I like the idea of this just being an isolated character study, an introspective movie that doesn't need to tie to the larger universe. If you really wanted to do something that relates to the larger story, perhaps when Hal is being told Laughley's origin by Uruk, she mentions that Laughley's fears nothing, except, and then insert talk about the source and the old gods and Darkseid. So, leaving this movie, Hal has reaffirmed himself as a man, knows who he is, what he's capable of, and the depths of his soul. He's done a lot of growing here. Perhaps the movie ends with Hal starting to come back to Earth. On his way, his ring picks up on a planet with a distress signal, so Hal goes down to investigate. Hal flies down to a world covered in smoke. At least that's what Hal thinks it is. However, as he gets closer to the surface, he realizes it's ash. The cloud of ash clears to see Darkseid's insignia burnt into the scorched ground. And cut. So, at this point we have a prophecy of Superman's death, a weakened Justice League with the death of the Flash, and Batman exiting the group at the end of JL2. On top of that now, we have Hal on his way back to Earth to deliver an urgent message, that Darkseid is coming. This brings us to our next title, the HBO series Batgirl. Now, Batgirl, Barbara Gordon needs her fair shake. It really sucks that her movie got canned, but I think this character has so much potential. I think her perspective could be the grounds to lead a really cool show. One that is focused on her, of course, as the lead, but also acts as a Batman Incorporated show. In the wake of Batman leaving the League and beginning Batman Incorporated, we start to see the Bat family expand to encompass Bruce's mission, not just to fight crime in general, but to take down Ra's al Ghul's emerging empire. Glimmers of that we saw in Nightwing in Phase 2, Dick and Selina discovering Ra's empire operating in Bloodhaven. Whilst the new Robin, Tim Drake, is willing to fall in line to come under the fold, Batgirl isn't. She just doesn't want to be a soldier in some guy's mission. Now, being just as analytical as Tim, but free thinking, she leaves the safety of Batman's guidance and enlists the help of another disenfranchised ex-protege of Batman, Nightwing. Seeing as he's had some experience dealing with Lady Shiva, he agrees to assist Batgirl on their mission to Infinity Island to take down Ra's al Ghul and his institution. Now, I think a show like this could get lost in the plot very easily. The mystery, or the Batman Inc. stuff, all that should instead enrich Barbara's character and her journey. A great example might be Barbara reaching out to Dick for help. Initially, what is a platonic alliance to solve a mission becomes an emerging romance as episodes unfold. We start to see how Dick changes Barbara for the better, to bring a joyful sense of play out of a methodical woman, to make her wake up to the fact that Bruce is too obsessed with the mission. He's had multiple protégés leave him or die, and continues to enlist soldiers for his cause, the latest being Tim. Perhaps the series ends with Barbara being her own woman, leaving Batman's side as the series ends. Moving on, we're picking up with Wonder Woman for her third and final installment. Like I said before, the core idea running through the Wonder Woman movies is a questioning belief in humanity, wrestling with her values, if humanity is even worth saving, seeing the good and bad of mankind. So, for Wonder Woman 3, I want to double down on this. I want this movie to be the culmination of that idea. I want to see the questioning belief in humanity on full display. I want to see the government's idea of a hero, first Diana's. How a cold approach to heroism, one without humanity, negates the point of being a hero. In a way, being a critique in the lack of humanity we've seen in superhero movies today. In this movie, we're going to adapt the Cadmus story from Justice League Unlimited. Amanda Waller heads up Cadmus, a response to the growing metas the US government sees as a security threat. Using Supergirl's DNA they collected back from Superman Brainiac, the government clones Supergirl creating a better, slightly older version of that in Power Girl. They also experiment with quantum energy creating Captain Atom, Nathaniel Atom, an Air Force pilot who volunteers for the program. These two powerhouses Waller sends out to be the government's heroes. The Justice League, led by Wonder Woman, deploys on a typical natural disaster mission. However, the Flash is dead. Batman quit the League, Aquaman has duties to his kingdom, John and Hawkgirl are off in space at this moment, Green Arrow and Black Canary are busy on a mission, and Superman is on his honeymoon with Lois, so Diana must lead a B-Squad consisting of loose cannons like the Atom, Vixen, and Guy Gardner. 
To add some focus to the group, she makes the Martian Manhunter the mission coordinator at the Watchtower, and enlists the help of her old friend, Kent Nelson, to don the helmet once more and become Dr. Fate. Naturally, heads will clash when Waller and company claim jurisdiction over events, saving people before the League can get there, all that, essentially forcing the League out. Dana's conflict here is navigating a world, or more specifically, a government that doesn't care about the individual lives anymore, heroes that just don't care about saving people, that it's just a job to Captain Adam and to Power Girl, that Waller and Cadmus just see civilians as a collective, as a number, not people. The government being the government decides to do increasingly shadier shit in the name of security, something Power Girl is starting to notice, something that doesn't sit right with her. The government goes so far as to hijack the League's watchtower, aiming it at a desert and firing. This unsanctioned misfire leads to a Senate hearing ordering the disbanding of the Justice League, that the League and the watchtower are just too dangerous. Dinah can just kill it in a scene standing up to the government and what it's become not only professing the League's innocence, but also reminiscing at the state of heroes and what they once were, and sadly, what they've become. Perhaps there's a scene where the heroes have to infiltrate Cadmus to prove their innocence, you know, collect files or something like that, in a way making great use of a character like the Atom. Anyway, they discover pieces of Red Tornado stored away. The League doesn't care too much, but to Diana and to Dr. Fate, that's their ally, their friend. Naturally, they'll be caught attempting to leave with Tornado, which solidifies the government against the League. Now things start to get tense in the third act, as the League isn't budging. They activate Red Tornado for the first time since he was destroyed back in 1945. A robot that found his humanity moments before his destruction, only to wake up to a world that lost its humanity. This parallels Power Girl, a woman who doesn't know who she is. A blank canvas, a clone. Power Girl, Captain Atom, and the American military are sent to take out the Watchtower in the third act, reclaiming the file the Atom stole. So the League defends themselves. Whilst the Martian Manhunter, Vixen, and the Atom take on the military infiltrating the Watchtower, Dr. Fate and Guy Gardner can take on Captain Atom, with Wonder Woman and Red Tornado left to fight Power Girl. Here is where everything comes to head. Diana and Tornado use their greatest asset, their belief in humanity and appeal to Power Girl, telling her to stop. Diana sees through her and pleads to her that she can be her own person. Tornado saying that she can forge a life of meaning by surrendering to her humanity, to not blindly follow instructions. This being ironic coming from an android of all people. Now whilst the fighting is going on, it's not really getting anyone anywhere. So Walla hijacks the watchtower again, this time aiming it at an American city. Washington, to be specific. Once Captain Adam and Power Girl hear this on the comms, they stop fighting and help the League, redirecting their energy to stopping this blast. With the League out of time and their plans exhausted, Power Girl, having applied what she had learnt, learning to be her own person, intercepts the blast which sends her crashing down to Earth dying, but for something, an act that showed her humanity. In the aftermath of the battle, the government is exposed for having caused both blasts. The government being the government don't actually pay for their crimes. The best they do is sweep who caused all this under the rug by sending Waller to manage a maximum security prison, Belle Reeve, <coughs> Suicide Squad. The Justice League have truly become international players here. Wonder Woman's words at the Senate hearing are echoed out over the world as we see a montage of our heroes. Captain Adam, feeling guilty he didn't step in front of the blast knowing he could have absorbed and redirected its energy, decides to join the League. Fate takes off his helmet and looks at his pocket watch of his long dead wife. The Atom, growing to a larger size, holds up a bridge whilst Guy Gardner helps civilians trapped on it. The movie ending with Wonder Woman having her belief in humanity affirmed by Power Girl's actions pleased with the hope of a better tomorrow. That hope of a better tomorrow crushed by the reality of Darkseid's impending invasion. So I know that was way more in depth than some of the others, but I just had such a clear vision for a third Wonder Woman movie, so I just needed to share that. That being said, I want to share a vision for another story, a HBO Max show that I would be just as excited to see, but don't need to spend nearly as long as explaining, Adam Strange. Adam Strange is just such a fascinating character. In the show Young Justice, he created the Zeta Beams, teleporters the heroes use. Eventually, he uses this technology to travel to a distant planet, Ran, becoming their hero, a very Star Lord type character. I think a really cool use of the character would be to have him discover a mother box on Earth, reverse engineering the technology and creating those Zeta Beams. Stepping through the portal, he appears on Ran, stepping out into chaos seeing the warriors of the planet alongside Hawkgirl and Jon Stewart fighting off the Thanagarian invasion. For those who have caught on, we're loosely adapting the Thanagarian Ran War from the comics. 
Regardless, Adam uses his brains and modifies alien technology to create a battle suit, jetpack, and blaster to join the fight. Typical hero's journey stuff, yada yada. Now, the show ends with our heroes backed into the corner. Thanagar has defeated Ran, only for a shadow to engulf the Thanagarian fleet. Everyone's confused, shocked at who would dare take on Thanagar at this moment. With no time to act, we see the mysterious fleet strike down on Thanagars, blowing their armada out of the sky, only to reveal the ones responsible for turning Thanagars' fleet to rubble. Darkseid. A ship makes its way to the ground, Kalabak steps out. John goes to fight him, but gets him too close and is subsequently flattened. Hawk Girl gets him out of there and Adam shouts to follow him. In a last ditch effort, they flee the planet, the three using the Zeta Beam technology to travel to Earth. Coming through, they destroy the portal on their end. The trio is injured, hopeful that the conflict is over. The last scene of the show, having decide reverse engineering the portal on Rand's side, figuring out where the trio went. Darkseid steps on a Thanagarian barely alive before entering the room to see a hologram of Earth light up the room. So, this brings us to Justice League 3. This is what everything has led to. We have a league that is fractured, stuck together by a B-team. Batman isn't helping as he's devoted his time to Batman Inc. The Flash is dead. We have a ticking bomb under the table in that of Supergirl returning to the past to try and save her cousin, and galactic heroes all returning to Earth to deliver the same message. Darkseid is coming. Hal is on the way, Adam, John, and Hawkgirl too. Now going into this, I don't think I can afford the time to do a play-by-play, -play, a scene-by-scene -scene type of thing I did with the first Justice League. Alright guys, hi, this is an editing note. Yeah, I totally got carried away, it's definitely a play-by-play. -play. Like Infinity War, this will truly be an ensemble movie. We'll have characters come in to play their part in the larger narrative. This movie should really feel like a finale, a combination of everything that has come before. Only it doesn't need to be two parts. I think we can make a perfectly great conclusion in just one movie. Sure to be three hours to let the movie breathe, for scenes to play out and engross us in the conflict, but I don't think the story demands two parts. We're keeping things simple, because say it with me, simple is effective. On a real note, keeping things simple allows us to create archetypal mythological tales with recognisable story beats that satisfy due to its inherent cohesiveness, but that's beside the point. What we have is a movie that is going to feel epic because it's not overstuffing you with crap. So without dilly-dallying any further, let's take a look at Justice League 3. Starting off, the movie will pick up directly after Adam Strange. The hologram of Earth fades away and Darkseid and Entourage head back to their ship. Whilst walking through the ruins of Ran, we see Parademons stabbing half-live Thanagarians. Desaad, being the worm of the thing he is, asks Darkseid what to do next. Darkseid tells Desaad and Kalabak to go to Earth, to silence the ones that escaped, that his search for the anti-life equation cannot be known. He says this as he floats away from them. The last thing he tells them is that failure is not an option. Moving to the Watchtower, we pick up with our trio, members of the Justice League International comforting our heroes who are clearly injured. John is taken to the Watchtower's ER by Vixen, the two sharing a slight moment here, where an injured John looks up at her. Strange and Hawkgirl talk with Wonder Woman and a few of the others on what they just witnessed. Hawkgirl, being the warrior she is, says that they need to re-engage and take the fight to them. Strange confused, saying, are you kidding? Did you just see what they did to John? The general point of this conversation is that they realise any plan they make will just not compare to whatever Batman could think up. So the League turns to Wonder Woman, Dinah having to swallow her pride and sit down with Bruce and convince him to rejoin the League. Cutting to Dinah, she's given Clark and Bruce the rundown on what they've known so far. Clark being a reporter is inquisitive with questions naturally, but Bruce is quiet. The more he hears, the more he thinks, plans. It's almost like he's on edge. All of a sudden, a boom tube appears with Orion, Big Bada, and Mr. Miracle stepping out of it, the three wanting an appearance with the leaders of Earth. They have an urgent message. Atrio says that we aren't leaders, we're just the Justice League. Bada saying, you're warriors. Miracle saying, they look more like champions to me. Superman correcting the two, saying, heroes. Batman not being one for semantics at this moment says, what is it you want? Orion responding, delivering them an urgent message. So, this scene will be our exposition scene. It'll be a little catch up for those that never watched the New Gods in Phase 2. Essentially, Orion will explain the ancient war between Apocalypse and New Genesis, the Treaty and Exchange of Sons, the Source and the Old Gods. He'll explain Darkseid's motivation to find the Anti-Life Equation and how that has led him here, to Earth. That Earth's heroes are the only fighting force standing in his way. Essentially, we move the conversation to the point where Orion, Miracle, and Bardo want to assist the League. Just as Superman goes to say something to Batman, time freezes. 
Bruce turns his shoulder to see Metron floating in the room. He introduces himself, warns Bruce that their plan, his plan, will not work. The dark side will reduce Earth to a cinder, scorch it into a hellhole like Apocalypse. Bruce asks, what do we do then? Metron says to give him what he wants, to give him the anti-life. Batman says that we can't do that, that we're done here. Metron leaves and time returns back to normal. Cutting to Metropolis, we witness a busy street vacated as a boom tube opens as Calabac, Desaad and a few parademons step out. Immediately, our heroes Zeta beam from the watchtower down to surround the pair, Superman telling them to surrender, that no one needs to get hurt, obviously not understanding who they are. Naturally, things will escalate to a fight. Arrow and Canary can take on some parademons, Vixen is shocked by Desaad, Captain Adam gets a few shots in on Calabac. The general point is that the pair get defeated. Orion killing Calabac to our hero's shock and dismay whilst Desaad boom tubes out of there. We see just a tinge of that dark side in him coming out. Orion tries justifying the murder to Superman and Clark having a real problem with it, saying we don't take lives. Orion posing the question back at him, well son of Krypton, what are you going to do when Darkseid arrives? Cutting to Darkseid's flagship, we see Desaad appear out of a boom tube injured. He tells Darkseid that Earth has champions, lots of them. Darkseid fixated on a holo recording of just one of them. He sees the emblem on the chest, a Kryptonian, a race thought to be extinct. This level of intrigue is turned to anger when Desaad informs Darkseid that Orion, his biological son, has killed Kalabak, his adoptive son. The scene moves to a point where Darkseid strangles Desaad in an afterthought. Granny Goodness was defeated in New Gods, Kalabak on Earth, and now Darkseid ends Desaad's life in frustration. A man, a god, that thinks it's better just to do it himself. Back at the Watchtower, everyone is assembled. We have the Bat family, Dick, Tim, and Barbara, the Justice League International, Vixen, Captain Adam, Red Tornado, Guy Gardner, Dr. Fate, The Atom, Green Arrow, and Black Canary, and of course we have the main Justice League. Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Martian Manhunter, Aquaman, Hawkgirl, Jon Stewart, and not The Flash? Wally is present, but he's on the outskirts, not feeling like he belongs yet, not feeling worthy of being The Flash. Hal Jordan is the last to appear, and so Batman goes over the mission brief alongside Orion. Whilst he's explaining the plan, the scene cuts away to smaller conversations that are happening during the brief. Nightwing putting his hand on Wally's shoulder, introducing himself, the two developing a rapport as he says he knows what it's like to be in your mentor's shadow, giving him advice, telling him not to worry, to be his own man. So, the focus switches back to Orion and Batman, Orion explaining how Darkseid typically invades planets, how he does it every time. Ship arrives, bombardment of the atmosphere, then waves of parademons, and then Darkseid himself. Batman acknowledging this leads the breakdown on the plan, breaking into teams. Half of the JLI and the Bat family will be led by Mr. Miracle and Barter. Their goal, to take out Darkseid's flagship and prevent it from raining fire on the surface like it did to Ran. This will keep any battle locked to the ground. The main Justice League will take the fight to Darkseid, working as one. Something Wally feels strange about, like he hasn't earned that role yet. The other big hitters of the JLI will take on aerial bombardment, hordes of parademons, localizing the battle to a specific area and preventing them to spread out. The heroes start to feel confident in this plan when an air vacuum begins to form. A time sphere appears. The heroes are on guard, ready to attack. A white light blinds them as Supergirl steps out. Okay, so the introduction to Supergirl at this moment must radically change a hero's confidence in their plan. There needs to be some level of tension that things are going to go wrong. They can't go into battle thinking that they're going to win. If they do, then we do. And if we do, then there's no tension in watching them triumph. So she embraces Cal with a hug, holding onto him a little too long and a little too tight. She urges him not to fight. He asks why, in concern, and with a dramatic punch, the League, the heroes, everyone watching, she says, you die. Everyone's faces drop. Cal looks into Kara's eyes, trying to process what he had just heard, realizing she isn't lying. Cutting to a scene with Wonder Woman and Batman overlooking space, they see Superman in the distance, meditating, hovering above the planet, listening to the sound of Earth. First it's people in trouble, then it's the good stuff, the sound of birthdays, children's laughter, the sound of Lois, the last one making him smile. What we're seeing is Superman taking in his love for the planet, coming to terms with the fact that he will die, that he is ready to lay down his life for Earth, for the people he loves. We see Batman watching him from the glass window, thinking about what Metron said, to let Darkseid win. All of a sudden, Manhunter yells out, incoming boom tube signature. Orion, expecting an Amada, yells out, how many? Manhunter says, just one. Cutting to Metropolis, a boom tube opens as Darkseid steps out. Suddenly our heroes are in deep water. 
Looks like their plan didn't account for this. So, this is essentially our midpoint. If we take a second to step back and to look at our story structure, we have the beginning. Darkseid establishing a status quo, we have our inciting incident, with our heroes warning others of the attack, we have what's called second thoughts, this is where Bruce and Metron meet, we then have the climax of Act 1 with Kalabak and Desaad's attack, after that we then move into a series of obstacles, mainly Kara returning from the future and warning Cal of his death. This brings us to our midpoint. Generally, midpoints shift the direction of the story, provide some kind of shock or revelation. So, having Darkseid appear the way he has has gone against how we thought this second act would play out, therefore shifting the direction of the story. So, our heroes Zeta beam down. Any verbal altercation, any pissing contest that goes on will eventually lead to a fight, but that's what Darkseid wants. Darkseid isn't an idiot by any means. He knows Orion would have helped them, told them how he will attack, so naturally he'll do the reverse. Only once the League has engaged him does his armada arrive, essentially throwing our heroes off balance. Once the flagship has arrived above Metropolis, the League dispatches their objectives, tries to stick to that plan we had before. We can see characters that have never met before try to work as a team. Batgirl, the Atom, and Mr. Miracle might do some sneaky infiltration stuff to get to a control panel in the ship. Big Barda might impress the hell out of Green Arrow, making a joke to Canary that she definitely eats her breakfast in the morning. Little moments like that, finding moments where our heroes have little wins and losses, where lives actually feel like they're in danger, or are seriously injured and taken out for the rest of the movie. Obviously, we would interlace this infiltration sequence with our heroes fighting Darkseid or some of the JLI fighting parademons, just so we don't forget about the fight happening on the ground. Batman can be directing the team via comms in his Batjet. Darkseid, understanding who's calling the shots, looks towards the jet in the sky, firing his Omega Beams. Batman ejecting moments before destruction. When Batman lands, he sees Metron in the distance, observing. Running away from the battle, Hawkgirl says to Batman, the battle is this way. Bruce saying to Shayara, there's someone I need to see first. From here, we get an epic scene of the Justice League just trying their best against Darkseid. Both Green Lanterns, Hal and Jon Stewart doing a cool combo move or something. We cut away to see Batman confronting Metron, yelling his name, he asks what he wants. He asks how to defeat Darkseid. Metron saying, if you really want to defeat him, come with me. Bruce nods, and the two disappear in a ball of light. Back on the ship, the gang are able to disable the weapon systems and take over the control of the ship. All seems well in the sky, but that cannot be said for the League down below. We see John hold his injured arm up against a wall, Hal thrown into him, the building coming down on top of the two. Hawkgirl and Wonder Woman both have a decent crack at Darkseid, Dinah's sword cutting open his cheek, but she too is stomped into the floor. Darkseid looks to be ready to kill her, but Superman and Supergirl charge him. From here, we get a very apocalypse-style fight. If you've seen that movie, you know what I mean. We just see the full might of what these guys can do. Supergirl might even be able to hold Darkseid down for a moment, enough for Cal to take a shot at him to try and kill him. But Cal, Clark, Superman cannot. He can't kill, not even Darkseid. So, concluding our second act, we have a crisis for our two leads. Superman is faced with the decision to kill, and Batman is faced with finding a solution that forces him to release control over a situation to trust. So, with Darkseid freeing himself and bodying the two supers, he looks to have the upper hand. This is where a golden portal appears and out shoots Booster Gold. Everyone has a very, who invited this guy, who the hell is that kind of moment as this wise ass loud guy charges in to defeat Darkseid and try save the day. Quickly being defeated, Gold understands maybe he bit off more than he can chew. To me, Booster Gold coming in like this would be a nice reversal of that Captain Marvel scene in Endgame. This powerful hero arrives to save the day, but quickly finds out that he's no match for Darkseid. Supergirl can help him up, and Gold can introduce himself, explaining how he's from the future and he's here to help. She says, me too. They both clarify which century they're from. Anyways, point being is Booster Gold is playing hero, but he hasn't really earned the right to call himself a hero yet. This speaks to Wally, who on the battlefield has been evading and playing smart up until this point. Wally hasn't built up the courage to take on Darkseid, but seeing Booster's bravado, or naivety honestly, makes him channel his inner Barry and speed in to take on Darkseid. He gets a few shots in, however Darkseid catches him off guard. Wally in fear looks to run away, however that isn't the case. Running around the earth, he strikes Darkseid, a very JLU moment. Darkseid, decently injured, recognises a pattern. Putting his hand out, he now has Wally by the throat. Wally phases through him, dropping to the ground. Darkseid simply says, flee. 
As his Omega Beams fire, Wally runs, evading them, hitting debris moments before the beam gets to him, ultimately knocking him out as he trips and crashes up against a wall. Back with Tornado, Fate, and that, they're holding off the Parademons pretty well, the scene ending with Aquaman launching a tidal wave across the portion of the city, taking out multiple invading carriers. Picking up with Batman, he is taken to the source wall with Metron, Metron giving us a quick crash course. He says, everyone, everyone who has tried to go beyond the source wall and achieve godhood, has been consumed and become a part of the wall. Even Darkseid's own father is among its victims. He states that on the other side of the wall is the power to defeat Darkseid. Batman, confused, says, you can freeze time, why don't you defeat Darkseid? Metron says that he's a scientist, his chief priority is to observe and collect data. Which brings us to the source wall. He wants to see the upper limits of the human species. If Bruce, one of the brightest on the planet, can withstand what hundreds of would-be conquerors could not that the source can only be passed through those of pure heart. Bruce understands that this is the only path to defeat Darkseid, and thus it's his only choice. We see Bruce leap into the inferno so to speak, his brain snapping in a barrage of imagery that evokes 2001, the scene ending as it fades to white. Back on Earth, we're in a real grudge match now. Darkseid is decently injured from Wally's big moment of courage, part of his armor being torn off. We hear Orion shout, Darkseid, at the top of his lungs, Darkseid, calmly stating that he needs to teach his son a lesson, even if he needs to beat that lesson into his skull. Essentially, this scene will be showing Darkseid's personal philosophy regarding punishment, how punishment teaches the mind. Defeating his son, all that lays there now to oppose him, is Superman. Superman faces Darkseid. Supergirl, injured, sees this unfolding. She thinks she knows what is going to happen. Superman is held down, looks to be defeated, looks like he's about to die. In slow motion, we see Darkseid ready to fire his Omega Beams at Superman. Kara jumps in the way though, taking the blast point blank, killing her. Now this to me would be an amazing third act twist. The entire movie, the entire phase three, we've been told Superman will die facing Darkseid, only with the knowledge of what the Legion has told her and some remnant cape in some future museum. But you know who also has a red cape? Supergirl. You know the Legion would try save Supergirl by bringing her to the future. What they didn't count on was her hijacking the time sphere, placing her in the very peril she thought she was avoiding. Now, this is where we enter our climax. If we take a second to think of it from Superman's point of view, in Brainiac, he lost his father and blamed himself for not being there, not being powerful enough. Now, events have repeated, holding Supergirl's lifeless body in his arms. Darkseid doubles down on his philosophy he was talking about with Orion, one of punishment. Let that be a lesson to you, Kal-El, he states. Superman, overrun by guilt and anger, goes to town on Darkseid. This is the final battle. Epic shockwave punches, super speed and lasers, all that jazz. Darkseid, however, manages to get the upper hand. Things look hopeless. All before, Bruce Wayne appears out of nowhere. Much like they did in JLU, offering Darkseid the anti-life equation. Bruce has survived the unthinkable and has transcended human form. He is pure energy now and is offering that to Darkseid. As soon as their hands touch, Darkseid feels something to be wrong, a corrupting nature, the anti-life used on him, the scene ending in a blinding light as Bruce and Darkseid disappear. So that's how we end the conflict, our heroes have managed to use the flagship to open up a boom tube and send the parademons back to apocalypse, some heroes are injured, some dead, and some we don't know where they are. Perhaps the movie can close out with Superman delivering a eulogy for Bruce Wayne and Kara. The point of the eulogy is to commemorate their sacrifice. He highlights in a broken voice, missing his cousin and his friend, that their humanity is what ultimately shone through, that allowed them to trust, to sacrifice, to have courage. As Superman is saying this, we see a montage of where our heroes are right now. Dick looking at the Batsuit, contemplating whether to take on the mantle like Wally did with the Flash. We see Booster Gold join the Justice League, shaking hands with the Atom. We see Hal flying off into space, you get the point. However, that speech is cut short when Clark is unable to speak. He pauses, broken. He says that, This was my family, my friend. Lois grabs a broken clock and they sit down. Dinah steps up to the podium and continues the eulogy. Essentially, this speech needs to tie up the entire point of these three phases, a tale of humanity. Eloquently delivered, she states the value these two heroes provided, the value every hero and every person provides when they stand up to evil, that evil only wins when good people do nothing. And scene. Look, I think we've done an alright job here, we've neatly tied up the story, subverted viewers' expectations with some twists, while creating some satisfying moments for fans as well. We've continued upon where these characters are at in regards to Wally, or foreshadowed a path some characters may take in the future. 
we've been able to conclude the story whilst capitalizing on the core themes of what these movies are meant to be about. Now, this whole endeavor, this video, the point of these pictures has been to highlight what I find most interesting about heroes, specifically DC heroes. It's their humanity. I think DC heroes separate themselves from Marvel in that they are not the real world. DC's heroes live in fictional cities, facing larger than life foes that are more than characters. They're forces of nature. Their enemies invite challenges, invite meaning, it being fitting to make a statement about humanity, about life, by having them face the DC's embodiment of death and dread in that of Darkseid. Throughout these videos, I've continuously circled back to the idea of humanity. If humanity is even worth saving, and how far these heroes would go to save us, or better yet, to preserve the idea that we are. DC Comics just has so much potential. Potential to explore fantastic themes and ideas Marvel just doesn't get the chance to touch on. We're dealing with gods here, heroes that stay grounded by their inherent humanity. Seriously though, any of these characters could take over the world. Alright, maybe not Green Arrow? But you have a hero with the most powerful weapon in the universe. A couple of heroes that take after ancient myth, Thena or Hermes for example. You have aliens and time travelers. The one concurrent theme is their ability to hope for a better day, to have a sense of personhood that is inherently human, a quality that grounds them and allows them to not look down on us, but hold our hand and be there with us. This is the core tenet of the Justice League, what they mean. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready to see that on the big screen. All right, hey there guys. Thank you for watching this video. I Anyone who's made it to the end, I love you. I just want to say specifically for my Illuminati subscribers, the next video I pitch, you guys will be able to vote on. You can do that now. There's a poll on my Patreon. Go ahead, vote. Whether that's X-Men, Spider-Man, that's up to you. Speaking of Patreon, I want to thank those Illuminati subscribers. Sam, Daniel, Julian, JJ, Christos, a dude from Krypton, K Raven, Young Stepper, Screenspark, David, Lidge, Draco, Alexis, Kai, Lance, Holland, James, William, and Rex, Michael, Carson, Brayden, Jai, and Luis. You guys are the reason I get to make videos like this. This would not have been made without you guys. Seriously, it kept everything afloat. I love you all. I also just want to thank everyone for making it this far in the video. If you've done that, you've, you've done great. With that being said, if you want to check out the rest of the DC videos, they'll be on the channel. With that being said, I will see you guys in a couple days with another video. So stay locked to the channel. Ciao.